violence. So that's kind of part one of my presentation. I'd like to sort of take it apart now and look at some of the electoral ingredients that went into uh, this election. Obviously, the credit for the success of the elections lies first and overwhelmingly with the Congolese people. Congolese people conducted themselves throughout with patience, courage, calm, great dignity, and steely determination. When the violence broke out, 20th, 21st, and 22nd of August, it was confined totally to one district of Kinshasa. The rest of the town, seven or eight million people, remained calm, and there was no disturbance anywhere in elsewhere in the country. Their desire for change after four uh, decades of dictatorship, corruption, chronic instability, and political drift punctuated by two deadly wars, has been the main driving force of the electoral process. All of us who had the honor and privilege of witnessing this historic landmark have enormous admiration for the Congolese people. In offering this lesson to the world, one senses among them a new sense of pride and refound dignity. Credit also goes very significantly to the DRC's Independent Electoral Commission and its president, Abe Malumalu. None of the members of that commission had ever voted. Starting from scratch, operating in a war-torn country with little to no infrastructure, poor communications, and limited transportation, it was the IEC, the Electoral Commission, that registered the 25 million voters, held the referendum, two combined elections, and trained and managed 260,000 electoral workers, often in precarious security conditions. It delivered and recovered ballots to 50,000 polling stations across the country under tight deadlines, sometimes using dugout canoes, motorbikes, and bicycles to transport the ballots. Despite criticism, pressure, and occasional threats from diverse quarters, the Electoral Commission was undaunted in carrying out its historic mission. By way of contrast, there were 890 polling stations in Haiti's recent elections, compared to 50,045 in the Congo. It took three helicopters to do the elections in Burundi and we needed 60 in the Congo. Um, credit also goes to the international community. Never in its history has the DRC benefited from such sustained international support. An international coalition, an unlikely alliance, was forged to accompany the Congolese march to the polls. Five peace accords, beginning with the Lusaka Agreement of July 1999, involving African countries, each accord bearing the name of an African city, more than 35 United Nations Security Council resolutions, South African, African Union, and Southern African Development Community involvement, a half billion dollars in international electoral funding, largely from the European Union and the United Nations peacekeeping budget, all contributed to the success. We should keep that $500 million in perspective. If you break it down per capita, the number of elections, it costs slightly more per capita than the elections in Haiti, and one-third the cost of the elections in either Afghanistan uh, or Liberia. A lot of money, but you can keep it in perspective. The DRC is also host to the largest United Nations peacekeeping operation in history, known by its French acronym, MONIC which has now lately been called Monique. <laughs> While Monarch's air fleet of more than 100 aircraft is the largest in UN peacekeeping history, as is its air safety record of 160,000 safe flying hours, Monarch's 17,000 blue helmets constitute the same size contingent as earlier the United Nations Force in Sierra Leone 
a country that is one twenty-fourth the size of the Congo. A lot of troops, a lot of ground to cover. It should be noted that the Congolese elections are also the largest elections that the United Nations has ever <coughs> sought to support. In three ways. The largest country, about the size of the United States, east of Mississippi. The largest electorate, 25 million, about 5 million more than the South African electorate. And the largest challenge, given the infrastructural and historical challenges that I mentioned earlier. In this regard, it's very important to point out that the United Nations at present is undertaking something in the Congo and the Sudan it has never done since peacekeeping began in 1948 formally. That is, to do peacekeeping and electoral support on a continent-sized basis with a major population. Congo with 60 million and the Sudan 40 million plus. And this brings me to my next point. How do you sustain such an operation? At a budget of a billion dollars a day, spending three a billion billion dollars a year, spending three million dollars a day, how do you sustain that kind of operation? It's never been done before. Are member states of the UN prepared to sustain their commitments in such large countries sufficiently long to ensure that good elections produce longer-term stability? People have asked me often, what is the worst case scenario? For me, the worst case scenario is good elections, nothing changes. Finally, the way ahead. Such tremendous achievements could be at risk should the international community repeat some of its past record. While we have a relatively good record as the international community in post-conflict management leading to elections, we have sometimes neglected the importance of post-electoral support and management. Early disengagement following elections in Haiti and Timor-Leste and elsewhere have resulted in the resumption of conflict a few years later, requiring new, more complex, and costlier international re-intervention. In Sierra Leone, Bosnia, and other countries, however, the international community stayed the course after elections, and today, those countries are on a much better track toward permanent peace and stability. The challenges ahead, therefore, may be greater than those of the just completed transition. These achievements could also be at risk if the DRC itself fails to learn from its past. Poorly functioning institutions, entrenched corruption, chronic economic mismanagement, repression of op opposition, and ill-discipline and uncontrolled security forces led to the country's collapse earlier. Today, democratic elections have restored the legitimacy of the government, and there is hope that the opposition will enjoy political space. But the DRC's newly elected government will have to develop the country's economy, ensure that its vast riches benefit its population. Building a disciplined military and police will also be critical for stability and the rule of law. The DRC, as you know, is a latent economic powerhouse. It has an estimated 10% of the world's hydroelectric potential, more than 50% of all the remaining tropical hardwoods. Uh, it is a cornucopia of mineral resources, including diamonds, gold, copper, cobalt, coltan, cassiterite, and much more. And with all these riches, the DRC not, need not depend for long on international aid if it seizes this chance to consolidate peace and start developing its economic potential. A few concluding words.